Tupolev had been wing designer on a number of major Tupolev aircraft. For its time, it was an advanced design. The PE-8 entered service in 1940 and took part in retaliatory raids on Berlin in 1941. But losses were heavy and such long-range raids were not persevered with. The PE-8 was used regularly throughout the war to fly VIPs to conferences of allies in Britain and in America. In its final form, it was at least as fast and its range at least as long as the multi-engine bombers of Britain and America. But the pressure in the Great Patriotic War was for small twin-engine tactical bombers and the PE-8 was never produced in quantity. The introduction of the extraordinary Boeing B-29 was an event of great importance to the outcome of the war. The United States now had an aircraft of unprecedented long-range, high-altitude performance. Throughout the war, the Soviets had made repeated requests to the Allies for a four-engine bomber to replace the PE-8. There was no response. The Soviets had already seen the need for a future strategic air force, given the massive striking power Britain and America now possessed. Then, in August and November 1944, three USAF B-29s landed on Soviet territory in the Far East after running low on fuel. Stalin had been presented with a windfall gift in the shape of the world's most advanced strategic bomber. Tupolev was ordered to copy the airframe, and Shvitsov, the engine designer, to copy the right whirlwind engines. Just one year later, the prototype Tu-4, the Soviet copy of the B-29, was flying. In April 1946, the Soviet long-range air force was revived. In 1947, Western authorities were shocked to see the first three pre-production Tu-4s flying in the Aviation Day Parade. It took two years to complete the flight test program, and the Tu-4 did not enter service until 1949. In the United States, the B-29 was already obsolete. But the Tu-4, codenamed by NATO Bull, was produced in quantity. One and a half thousand were built before production ended in 1954. The end of the Great Patriotic War in 1945 was a great turning point in the history of the Soviet Union. Four years of extreme struggle had ended in victory. For a population that had been totally committed to resisting Hitler's invasion and turning it back on itself, celebration was sweet. The task of rebuilding the ravaged nation was immense. The litter of war was gathered, committed to furnaces, and melted down. But the steel of the German guns and helmets and tanks and trucks would not all be reformed into post-war equivalents of plowshares. As the Soviet nation was marshaled to rebuild, the Kremlin confronted a new world strategic situation. The possibility of another war, a war between East and West, was looming. If the United States could drop a nuclear bomb on Hiroshima, it could equally deposit one on Leningrad. And the Soviet military had little knowledge of radar early warning systems or jet engine design or surface-to-air defenses. At the Paris Peace Conference in 1946, 
U.S. Secretary of State Burns summarized the situation from the American point of view. Members of the conference, we must try to understand one another even when we cannot agree with one another. We must never accept any disagreement as final. We must work together until we can find solutions which, while not perfect, are solutions which can be defended. A world longing for peace will not forgive us if in striving for perfection we fail to obtain peace. The United States believes that those who fought the war should make the peace. The 1947 May Day Parade in Red Square continued the pre-war Soviet tradition of mammoth shows of military strength. In spite of the scale of the display, Stalin knew that Soviet military technology was lagging behind the West. The great Convair B-36 could fly 6,800 miles and carry 84,000 pounds of bombs. Its appearance forced the Soviets to develop a large version of their B-29 copy, but by the time it was ready, America had leapfrogged into the age of the intercontinental jet bomber. In April 1947, Berliners struggled with floods and a Soviet blockade of their city, which aimed to force the Americans and British out of the former German capital. In poor weather conditions, one of the American aircraft flying supplies into Berlin crashed. It was the beginning of an airlift in which British and American planes flew thousands of tons of food a day over the Soviet blockade. What was now being referred to as the Cold War deepened. Relations between the West and the Soviet Union reached new levels of stress. After three months of blockade, the situation was deadlocked and in September 1948, the question of the reunification of Berlin was submitted to the United Nations. This is Dr. Philip Jessup of the American delegation giving his country's view of Soviet action in Berlin. Soviet government, using the harsh instrument of the blockade, has indeed chosen a strange way in Berlin to live up to its agreement to democratize German political life. Thanks to the air bridge and to the support given it by the Berliners, the Soviet government has not succeeded in its purpose. Now, Mr. President, as I pointed out to the Security Council before, we could have used our armed force against the Soviet threat, or we could have meekly submitted and surrendered our rights and duties in Berlin, subjecting nearly two and a half million Germans the Soviet rule with all that that implies. What we actually did, and what we're still doing, is to live up to our obligations under the Charter of the United Nations and try to settle the question by peaceful discussion while continuing to discharge our obligations in Berlin. By May 1949, the blockade was over, but the Western powers had formed NATO, the North Atlantic Treaty Organization, a united front against the Soviet Union. By 1952, the world political situation had become even more tense. The Soviet Union had announced that it possessed nuclear weapons, and America had tested the hydrogen bomb. The communist German Democratic Republic had been established, so had the People's Republic of China. The Korean War was continuing. In America, General Dwight Eisenhower ran for the presidency and won a landslide victory on the side of the Republican Party. It wasn't the only radical change in world leadership. In March 1953, 
Joseph Stalin, who had been the power behind the Soviet Union for almost 30 